Tonight's program with Dr. Grantley Warren. Among the many concerns that citizens of a democratic society have to worry about from time to time are essentially questions of the people to whom they entrust the responsibility to manage their affairs and and equally the institutions which in a fair and transparent manner would reflect their choices record them and and give them an opportunity of the confidence that their preferences are being registered therefore in a real sense that's what we do at elections such as we had in November 2011, the national elections, where people basically said, look, we want a little bit more of an inclusive uh, governance as the part, the way in which we will pursue our, our affairs. Uh, for some of us, that was the interpretation. Um, uh, in a real sense, what we saw then for the first time, the government did not have a majority in the parliament. Theoretically, then, it should not have been able to have its way rubber stamped as we had hitherto been accustomed in previous parliaments. And then, in a similar way, we are expected to have local government elections to man our, our local affairs. Because at the end of the day, that is really this thing is intended to to be rep reflectful of people's preferences but we have not had those since 1994 and we could therefore say that people's preferences for these last 19 years have not either been reflected clearly not recorded because there were no elections and consequently we have been drifting in a sea where the captain alone knows where he was going now, on this issue of spotlight, we t follow up on the June 13th Next Steps edition that we did, which was basically saying to the country at large, look, some of us think that there are some things that should be addressed frontally and that we shouldn't get preoccupied with the firefighting as one discussant described it about who is doing what, where and how, and whose house is bigger than what, and letting this facade of though important questions of corruption, etc., being the focal point when there were much larger issues that, that talked to the heart of this question of governance in our country. Elections and Elections Commission were identified as one such area for, for concern. We have a large cast this evening uh, of gentlemen who have made it their business to try to help us register our preferences. I'd uh, call them all politicians, but in particular I'd like to identify Mr. Aubrey Norton, a former General Secretary of the PNC, or Mr. Uh, and a former member of parliament as well, since we are talking elections and all of that, Mr. David Patterson, the current secretary of the Alliance for Change, and Mr. and Dr. Uh, David Hines, who is an executive member of the, the Working People's Alliance. Gentlemen, 
uh, welcome to Spotlight. We have invited Mr. Vincent Alexander uh, more as a resource person for this evening's discussion on the question of elections and elections, uh, elections commission. He himself being an elections commissioner and um, not without political insight. I think at one stage he was the vice chairman of the People's National Congress reform but here specifically to assist us on the technical issues as, as we see them, as we discuss this most important question, at least as viewed by many of us, as uh, an area of specific concern for this country. You know, the current Elections Commission, we were thought, for those of us who were looking at the events as they unfolded themselves, was a one-off arrangement post-92 with the Carter intervention, etc. So we were to have gone into the 1997 elections with this Carter formula as to how the way in which we were going to structure this Elections Commission and, and how it was going to pursue its mandate. Thereafter, it was intended that this should have been an area of urgent review. We since had 1997 elections and the trauma of the, the, that period, violence in the streets, etc. We had a constitution reform, yet it appeared as if the constitution reform did not deal with this issue, which was considered to be so uh, important prior to even 1992 and the intervention of Carter in this country. That's where I want to start this discussion. I wonder if you could uh, perhaps, um, you could all reflect on the fact, what were some of the reasons that, that uh, encouraged us in such a fundamental way to say that the Elections Commission, with which we, we treated in 92, 97, 90, you know, and even before, something was wrong with it, and why we should have changed it, and why in fact we never did, once we had the opportunity in 97, when we were supposed to have had major electoral reform and other kinds of reform, constitutional reform. Who wants to start? If I could take a shot at it myself, having been a, a commission in the Constitutional Reform Commission. Oh, good. Um, the problem identified with the commission was that it was a political commission in the sense that it is comprised of seven commissioners, three of whom are nominees of the president or the government, another three who are nominees of the leader of the opposition, and a chairperson who is appointed by the president from a list of nominees put up by the leader of the opposition that must be acceptable uh, to the president. So what you have is a political configuration, really, um, as an elections commission. And one would, in normal circumstances, expect an elections commission to be a, a non-partisan body uh, that can professionally uh, stand back and oversee a process without being reflective of an interest in the outcome of that process. And one can hardly say that of a commission where the members are so closely associated with, by virtue of the method of appointment, uh, the political parties. I think that was the difficulty uh, that, that we were faced with in terms of the composition, the need for a commission uh, with a difference. But I would like, probably provocatively, to add to that concern the fact that there are those who have said, you know, leave well alone, meaning this that given the composition of the commission, you know what to expect. But given the nature of the society, Guyana, and the level of politicization of the society, and the experience with other constitutional bodies that are not appointed in the same manner, that you were faced with the problem of, if you were to not constitute it the way it's constituted, then you're not quite sure what the deal will be. No, the deal is a bad deal, but you know about it. You may get a worse deal and not know you're getting that. 
Mm. So that's the element that some people have come to in saying, look, leave well alone. Interesting point. Uh, if, I may pick, uh, sure. if I may pick up on that, I mean, sure. the very chairman of the Elections Commission is supposed to be uh, a, a creature. The, the, the latter um, point that um, uh, Vincent is making, that is supposed to be this consensus person. And uh, every chairman we have had, uh, whether it's Dude Not Singh or uh, Suresh Bali, so there have been charges. Some of them, um, uh, some of them, that's <laughs> uh, uh, challengeable. Uh, well, <laughs> some of them are not easily challenged. But 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 the independence of such a person is always questioned, and um, uh, the persons by their actions sometimes invite those kinds of charges um, that they are allied. To, uh, in 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 our case, the charges against our chairpersons of the elections commission is that they are aligned with the ruling party. Um, and so, therefore, Vincent point um, is, is is well taken. But I do think that um, I think part of the problem with the elections commission is part of the problem that we have with our political situation. In the sense that um, it's very difficult to correct these things in a piecemeal fashion, as you suggested in the introduction. That I believe that what we need is an overall political solution. And that if we have a political solution, which is an agreement as to what kind of political system we want, how are we going to run this country, then out of that will come the kind of models that we will use. And I think so long as we avoid a political solution, and for me, a political solution has to speak to the ethnic makeup of the country, it has to be, speak to the political makeup of the country, and it has to speak to the aspirations of the country. Um, I would say at the time of independence and as we move forward, um, what kind of economic system, what kind of political system, what kind of nation we want. And once we settle those, then the formulas um, and the models for like an elections commission um, would flow out of that. But I think so long as we try to correct a little piece here, correct a little piece there, we are going to run into the, the, this, the, this problem of, of is this commission, is this model the best model for us? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, first and foremost, um, good night, Granite, good night, um, mm. fellow contributors. Um, I, I like to welcome myself to Spotlight. <laughs> <laughs> I trust I did first so. Time. Yes, <laughs> uh, 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 to me, and as Vincent and, and David has, has said, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, the formula that we have was um, agreed at in 1992, with the understanding, you mean, whereby I mean, you, you see the election chairman from a list on a, not unacceptable to the um, to the president and those things. That was an interim measure, and as Vincent said, you mean you, you, that it has continued because. Better the devil you know than the, bev the devil you don't know. But I think it is time now that we start addressing the entire composition of GCOM. I mean, the role, the meaning. In, um, I like, if, you, if you use an example like Jamaica, they have an independent body who doesn't only oversee elections. I mean, the Rotary Club has a annual election. The Jamaica, they're, they're such a professional body that they send somebody a, a, as a returning officer. I mean, we have to start to move to that. I mean, in inclusionary, I mean, of course, there will always be a place for political parties, but we start uh, expanding the composition that you come because this is not, I know the major stakeholders in the election, uh, it would be the political parties, but we have to start, I mean, but, but the, it is a national effort. So therefore, we should start expanding the composition of GCOM so that, um, Persons such as the position of Vincent took, and I mean, and I like to say, now on the record, before I even continue, before we, the discussion gets any further, um, commended the, the position, the independence position that Vincent has taken um, from myself personally. I mean, he knows my um, personal opinion. And from my party, I like the independence opinion. So we have to now start to develop bodies such as that. You are, I mean, they're the collective, however, independence of thought and the principle should be the overriding uh, factor <laughs> for, for these things. Because w when it comes to elections, Guyana has had a troubled elections from 
since independence. I mean, they've always been there because it's our country. There's always a, I mean, a winner take all sort of situation. There's always be persons that are disenfranchised or you non know, disenfranchised. I mean, they, they oppose the results. And we have to get to a stage whereby people recognize that, you know, I mean, as long as the uh, mechanisms are there and the persons that we offer the independence to, uh, we offer the, the authority to, will execute their, their, their jobs with fear, without fear or favor. Um, that can only argue well for this country. Mm. Aubrey, you are the last one on this one. Um, I think, first of all, that the problem is a very deep rooted problem. I've argued in articles that I've, I wrote that Ghana has this problem of either a dysfunctional or a non-existent civil society. And therefore, you don't have people with the level of independence that is required. And if you find people with independence, then ethnicity comes in. And that raises another question of how independent you can be. So to me, the problem is, is very deep-rooted. That has to be taken against the background of a political history in virtually all the political parties, particularly those of long existence, in which elections have been tampered with. And so there is not a culture in the political parties of having elections that are free and fair and have the credibility and acceptability of the people after the election. And I think here is where the, the problem lies. The problem lies in a history in which we accept results if it suits us. If it doesn't, we're in trouble. And so you have to know, Vincent suggests, and some people suggest, that you need to depoliticize. That is, take the political parties out of it. But if that was the solution, then you wouldn't have a problem with Bunu. Because he's not a representative of the political party. He is supposed to be a public servant operating in the interests of the people. Unfortunately, he isn't. He is a man who has made two mistakes, one place. To me, not a mistake, like Vincent has argued. What, in fact, you have is the absence even of an independent professional core that can do the work and obtain the respect, the, the credibility that is required. So to me, there is a crisis in the political system there's a crisis in the managerial, the public service structure. And to the extent that those crises aren't solved, we are in deep trouble. I do not know that if we, I think the political party system should go. I don't, I'm not so sure I know what to replace it with and who to replace it with because it is very difficult to find anybody that is considered independent. And the minute that you make the first decision that goes against one of the political forces, you will be seen as right. not independent. So I believe it, it, you have to rectify the problem, probably train a new generation that accepts responsibility of being professional and unhampered by the, the political system. But that becomes more difficult with this corrupt system and with this corrupt set of people who have money. I believe if you bring somebody from the skies, they will try to corrupt them, if not successfully. <laughs> well, I, I tell you, the, the discussion in a certain sense preempts the next two sets of questions, but uh, Vincent even in his started the ball of rolling by alluding to the fact uh, about the search for independence, what it really means. I hear David saying on the one hand, look, if you don't treat with the, the whole question of of uh, a society that has that is, that is, that is got a strong uh, civil, civil uh, society grouping. You also said that, Aubrey. And if you don't have a political culture which accepts um, certain outcomes, or a number of sets of reasons, 
this thing can happen. Of course, the race boogie um, being high on our, all of our concerns. I, I tell you, we, we can't run from it. I know we can't solve it tonight, but I'm certain that you would, we would collectively want to start trying to look at approaches to the independence that we need. Or are we left that the best approach we have is this political solution? Perhaps you may want to hazard a guess there. I, I agree, Taking the realities I of agree society. fundamentally with David's point. That, and, and I normally would look at that from the standpoint of the political culture that we have, is what we really have to change, the political culture. Um, and the, the question has been, how do you change that? Um, and very often it seems to be the egg and kind of situation. But I, I think that in our circumstance, one has got in the first instance uh, to try to cultivate um, a culture being rule-based, so that even where people have a disposition, if they accept that things are based on rules and regulations, then their their dispositions could be curtailed by those rules and regulations, and they could serve. So it's really a rule of law kind of good governance approach that initially has to to be embraced. And I think that that is probably the easiest place to start because really, if you seriously, for example, get a, a chairperson of a place like the Elections Commission who is very strong on that, then that person could in fact bring to bear that influence in fashioning the organization. I think what we need is, is probably to start with one significant organization being fashioned and become an example of how things uh, should be done. And I don't think we should ignore the Jamaican experience. The, the, the tribalism between the two parties in mm -hmm. Jamaica was mm -hmm. so great. It was unbelievable. And believe you me, in that society, even with continued tribalism between the parties, they've come around to have complete and total respect for their elections commission. Well, since you have thrown that out, perhaps we should then share some of the essential elements of the Jamaican experience. Why is it they have been able to assemble a, a group of persons who ostensibly would have a greater sense of independence, notwithstanding, I'm certain, their own political affiliations? Because I'm certain that there is not a person out there who does not have a political affiliation if you're a citizen and you are aware. How do you, what it is that they have done that, that we have not been able to approach or you find difficult for us to approach? I think they had an advantage. The pool they had of professionals, uh, people who uh, valued their professionalism, was much larger than, than the pool that, that, that we have. We have, to a large extent, for all sorts of reasons, destroyed a lot of those uh, values and a lot of those people um, have left the shore so that the pool to draw from here is, is a much smaller pool. If we had a larger pool of people who are being referred to as the civic society kind of people, then we could make a start. And so I think we've got to search very hard. Uh, and I would, I would be bold to say that not to start the comment about the experience with elections commissions, that we came pretty close to that kind of person in the person of retired Major General Joe Singh. But he didn't stay long in the job. But, but um, okay, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. There's also something which um, the Jamaican um, situation, comparatively, we have to take, a, um, take knowledge of. The, I think the Jamaican society recognized the implications that can f the fallout that can happen that if you have a God remember they are a more um, which is a reactive and proactive sort of people <laughs> so that they recognize the thought that if, if the people because they will take to the streets a lot quicker that is one of the things so therefore yeah. they they that is one of the reasons why right they I mean I, I not understanding the pool right but if the people don't have any um, if people don't have confidence in the process, the implications as well. I mean, yeah, but they've had, I, I, I have lived through 63, I've lived through, no, but all of us have lived through all of those things. I think there's a variable in the Jamaican situation that mm -hmm. we're not addressing. Guyana has a different history to Jamaica. Particularly 
after the 1968 coming back this side in Guyana, you had a situation where the major political parties were strong left-wing parties in the sense of the PPP saying they were left-wing, the WPA saying they were left-wing, PNC saying they were left-wing. The UF was right-wing but small and didn't develop the strength. In Jamaica, it was slightly different. You always had, while you had Manly as a socialist party, you always had a strong right-wing party called uh, Siaga's party, I don't remember the name, the Jamaican Labour Party. Mm -hmm. The Jamaican Labour Party. What that meant was that in Guyana, the debate was how we move in the direction of socialism. And so we didn't cultivate a lot of the civil service type approach, which Jamaica did. In Jamaica's case, Manly was always under the watch of the GLP. And the GLP kept a careful scrutiny on anything that moved away from Westminster in a way that it didn't happen in Guyana. In Guyana, you could have moved away from Westminster in solidarity with the socialist world. And I, I raise this because I believe the period in which we embrace socialism, there were differences between the political parties. But none of the political parties focused on the rule of law and a professional civil service in the way it happened in Jamaica. And I believe that has allowed Jamaica to develop the professional core that Vincent speaks about. And that professional core kept the pressure on the politicians in a way that it didn't happen in Ghana. I now come to the solution. And that is why I believe the solution has to lie in a new generation that cultivates professionalism, that understands that there is need for checks and balances, and that politicians can be trusted with power. I can make the last point before I go. One of the fundamental problems in the Guyanese society is we trust our own with power and distrust others, not recognizing that our own people as well, and when they get power, they will abuse it. So to me, the system has to emerge in which you always keep politicians in check because power that isn't in check is power misused. And the problem with the Guyanese society is a heavy misuse of power. If I may, if, if I may um, <clears throat> uh, take a jump off from Aubrey's last point, I think, and I, and I, I agree with the, the observations on Jamaica, but I think there's also something else. When you speak to Jamaican people, whether they're JLP or PNP, they're Jamaicans. Mm -hmm. In Guyana, we have two Guyanas. African Guyanese conception of what is Guyana is different from Indian Guyanese conception of Guyana. I knew that under the PNC, um, East Indians, for the most part, didn't even pay attention to national symbols and the national anthem and the, the, those songs and so on, national songs. They did not feel that they were part of the nation. And we find the same thing now that the PPP has come into power. We see um, a, a East Indian Guyanese embracing um, nationalism in a way that African Guyanese are not embracing nationalism. So there is not a shared overarching um, set of values. Um, that we share in Guyana, that our sisters and brothers in the Caribbean do. I mean, Barbadians, regardless of whether they're BLP or DLP, they're Barbadians. And so I think fundamentally, going back to my original point, fundamentally that is the problem that we've got to um, tackle. This new generation that Aubrey's talking about has to be a generation of East Indian and Africans and Amerindians who have something that they share, that they can call Guyana, that we all share. So I, I think that's where the struggle is. And my own view is that we need to begin at the place where we disagree most. And the place we disagree most is the question of power, the question of political power. And that's why I think that if we solve, or at least begin to um, address the question of an equitable distribution of political power, then what we will do is minimize the fears 
and the insecurities which each ethnic group has. And if we are able to minimize that, then perhaps um, that can be an opening for the cultivation of this, and I hate to use a new term, this new Guyana person, this new Guyanese um, that cuts across ethnicity and that share um, social and cultural values. Mm -hmm. David, uh, yes? I want to make a quick point as well, too. I think, too, if the Guyan economy takes off, then there will be more to share. Of course, not under this government, because they seem... <laughs> yeah, and I mean clear about that. It, it, an increase of wealth in this situation will not result in a distribution that serves the people. But I'm talking about a situation where the, the society, the economy takes off, wealth increases, and there is a reasonable distribution across the society, class, ethnic groups, etc. I believe that will reduce, significantly attenuate the divide and permit the political kind of solution that David is talking about. Because I do not believe that in economic crisis, it is easy to deal with. I, I just want to add to that, because I don't think the wealth creation itself is a solution. What the wealth creation does is to provide a breathing space yeah. to work yeah. on the solution. Yeah. Right. That's what I yes, I, I, <clears throat> I suspect that um, <laughs> the day when um, we could all recognize that a signatory to the Treaty of Chagaramas and one of the central figures in the creation of the CARICOM community was Forbes Burnham, and that all Guyanese should embrace that as a, fun, as a fundamental fact. I think it's just purely an extension of the point being made by David until we start becoming as we have a sense of commonness that we are one in that sense. Jamaicans, God knows I studied with them, they are Jamaicans, first and foremost, everything else afterwards. And I think it's something, it's a fundamental point. If we are going to go to the point of starting to take on other things that can be, rule of law, for instance, if you have a common understanding of your place in the scheme of things, it's easier to accept the rule of law. And I think that's a point that's really well taken. Now, the, the AFC in 2006 claimed that Prime Minister Hines is sitting on a seat that belongs to them. In 2011, just prior to the declaration of the results, there was some confusion about the fact that the, election, the chief elections officer was about to declare the PPP as the winner of the elections on the basis of a majority. Vincent, you were involved as an elections commission on that particular um, uh, commission. And in the press this week, we noted that you have penned a note which, as you have claimed, allows you to come out of the... Uh, closet my word. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had this. You said break his silence. <laughs> break his silence. Break your silence. Break your David silence. David is here saying me. Try the words. <laughs> yeah, break your silence. And to tell it as you saw it. Let's start with first the breaking of your silence, why now? And secondly, let's look at the question of the institution of the chief elections officer and the controversy which seems to have developed around it. Because we notice now, anyway, we'll deal with some of the other stories there. So let's start with that. I think anytime somebody does something, you must focused and have some objective in mind. You mustn't just do something because it's fashionable or because people say you must do it. You must have a reason why you do it. Um, in 2011, my task as a commissioner was to ensure that there was a the conduct of a fair and free elections. And uh, the, that was threatened in so far as uh, there were results being prepared 
that were not reflective of the will of the people. And at that time I made what I thought was an essential intervention and focusing on making sure there was free, fair, and so forth, enabled the commission to deliver the result that was required. That was fair. At that time I didn't think it was a wise thing uh, to show into the public domain a lot of what had happened internally because of the political dynamics on the outside. And I felt that given the political dynamics on the outside, the volatility that the nation would have been not best served by what might have evolved. So having delivered what was fair, and having achieved the objective, I didn't see it as being prudent to go and fuel the fire, so to speak, at that time. Now the question would arise, well, why now? Clearly, that's, that's what now? we all want to know. You re we read um, the dispatches. We have been having a prolonged period of discussion in the Commission on the question of the appointment of the Chief Elections Officer. And while we have been working and having our own internal problems with arriving at the position, in the public domain, there are those who are trying to fashion the outcome or to point fingers at those who may not uh, arrive at an outcome that they, they, they desire. And the way in which they've been doing this is by attempting to suggest that we are obligated to return Mr. Boudou uh, to the position of elections officer. They've been saying, well, we know, like the whole nation knows, that something went wrong, it was corrected in 2011, but that what happened was a mere mistake, that Boudou is the best thing after sliced bread, and therefore, he must be returned, and those people who are trying not to return him are involved in some act of ethnic cleansing, because that is in fact a position that the Indian Arrival Committee took, publicly facilitated by the Chronicle, which really annoyed me, that we were involved in ethnic cleansing. And so I thought that the truth should become known, so that you create the environment in which the decision that's going to be made is clearly understood to be an objective decision, and one which again follows the principles of, of fairness and justice. And so as we got closer to a, a, the point of making a decision, and as the internal, external forces sought to create an environment that would hamstring us, I thought that I need to have the commission relieve itself of, of, of that environment. And the only way to do that was to dis have disclosure on what pertained so that people can understand why is it we were approaching the question of an elections commissioner, uh, elections, chief elections office, the manner in which we were approaching it. The time had come for it to be known. The volatility had subsided. The environment is much more capable of absorbing the information. And the information, in fact, will create the kind of environment for the kind of decision we need to make internally to take GCOM forward. Mm -hmm. uh, well. Um, I'll say this, I mean, um, notwithstanding all that Vincent would have said, uh, um, for uh, m us, the lines would change, I mean, uh, the, the, the question of the chief election officer um, being reappointed was a, is a simple question. I mean, the, 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 the previous chief election officer from the lines would change has a basic flaw in this, that he can't count AFC votes. He's never been able to effectively count the AFC votes. A responsible party, we can't be telling our supporters to go to in another election with somebody to him that can't count our votes. You mean when you say can't count your votes, that means your experience in 2006? 2006 and 2011, yeah, okay. the seat yeah. that would have been, yes. um, the matter would have been um, the AFC's vote. And, 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 and it's all, and if you want to be Machiavellian, it's all pretty well thought out. I mean, the, the, the party that would um, least that is least able to um, agitate with is the AFC. And, and we, have, we have to be very realistic on that, you know what I mean? So therefore, it's, it's easier to, to, to um, disenfranchise the AFC than it would be the APNU or anything else. Yeah, but just purely because of the historic roots in which the AFC, the AFC and the other parties has come. But speaking, going back historically, 2006, the elections was August the 28th. 
on the evening of August the 28th, we received information about the disparity in votes in certain polls, um, polling booths, which were um, publicly declared by GCOM uh, through the media monitoring um, unit. We contacted GCOM. We informed them about um, about our concerns. We met them on the before the declaration. I think the first of September. I think the declaration was on the second or the third. I mean, uh, we met them. We, we expressed our concerns. We showed them the information from our returning officers. And while we are now discussing the question of Koku Budu, right? We have to uh, we have to go back to our, your original point. The entire GCOM. Um, composition because I, if it's you weren't there so I'm sure this would not have happened but we met just like the same distance to which I'm sitting from you and, and my other colleague we met with the chairman and other other members of, of, of GCOM and they admitted to us yes and I'm telling you now I'm saying in front of you they said yes there was a mistake this is before the declaration however they said and they give us the explanation of the region 10 um, person was ill and they were on medication and they went home to sleep and that's why they, they did a mistake. Well, uh, Vita would have... Uh, and that said, you said bring out the violence. No, 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 <laughs> no. no. I, I, and, and, and I would readily admit to the Guyanese public, naivety had a strong part to do with this because we believed in the system. So therefore, a lot of people said that the AFC now is confrontational and we don't, we don't back down. We are a product of, of, of the system. So we met with them and we said, well, fair enough. And they said, well, uh, and they give us the insurance that this something will, will be addressed. Right? I'm saying publicly, and that including the chairman, the current chairman, who was there. For, and they said, it will this be is Mr. Steve Surabadi. Steve yeah. Steve Surabadi. And they gave us uh, the undertaking that, th that they will address this. However, right, that um, after they declared the results, we said, well, you know, they said, well, how, I mean, this is the law because of the friction in the previous, um, the two political parties. Nothing can be undone unless you go to the election petition. Naive as we were, we said, fair enough. We expected, they said, we filed our election. We expected that the PPP obviously would um, object. And I, I want to question, I want, I want to clarify something. We never said that the Prime Minister was sitting on We said squatting. Right? He's illegal occupant. He's squatting. He had no rights there, huh? In 206. No. And so we said, fair enough. We entered our election petition, thinking, well, of course, the PP will object because naturally this, this will be reducing their, their, their parliament. We never, in our naive state, believed that GCOM would file an objection, having had spoken to the GCOM chairman and everything. And so it was so our first major surprise with GCOM was that Goku Budu filed a response that says that we have a frivolous claim. I well, see. A frivolous claim. Uh, but but I, 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 I want to say this. I want to I wanna end, I mean, I know, I want to end on saying this. Thing here, so. This. And, and, and I walked with this because um, it's important for us to see, for, for the country to know the whole construct I mean, with it. Is, I mean. The chairman told us, brought out the original statement to polls and showed us exactly what had transpired. And we took it. And, and, and for two months, right, for two months after the election, we were hoping that the electorates, the, 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 the court system would, would resolve it. And it didn't. Despite all of that, and I, 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 and I like to just quote a little paragraph from the, and to tell you that, uh, why we have a the thing. This is from WikiLeaks. This is a, uh, a, a cable um, written on November 6th, 2011. May I just quote a paragraph in this weekly? So this is, this is a, a cable authored by David Robinson, who was a um, chairman of GCOM at that time. I'm um, chairman of the um, US ambassador at that time. And I quote here, I mean, it's section 5C, just so the transparency, I know you are. GCOM Commissioner Steve Sujbali told the political officer privately that he considered the AFC's claim baseless and GCOM was holding off on responding to avoid embarrassing the AFC. 
That is a statement from the chairman of the Elections Commission after having sat down with us and, and acknowledged the mistake. Right? So therefore, the, the, the question is not just the CEO. Right? The question, as we said, the independence of the entire organization. The right. most I can do is welcome you to the real political world. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. You know, I want to make a point. I really don't plan based on a lot of time. Vincent is very erudite. This one is sophisticated. To me, <laughs> Bruno is as simple as you. He has consistently served the PPP and he must go. I personally haven't been involved in any campaign to ensure that Goku Bulu does not go back as election commission chairman. The rest of sophistication I can deal with when I'm at presenting a university paper. But for the real politics, Boudou has shown that he doesn't make mistakes. He ends up always on the side of the government. There's nothing independent about him, and we shouldn't really be wasting time. We should just let Boudou go home. Good. On that note, we will take a, a break and recognize our sponsors. And uh, the, we take a break at this time. <clears throat> yeah, after two, Ow! belongs to you. <laughs> after two, belongs to you. I like this. Talk for two minutes and get ten free more value with GTNT. It stands to say into you. Start talking, then after two, talk, talk, talk. No limit, two for ten. Get with it! GTNT brings more value to you. Talk for two minutes and enjoy ten free. GTNT best value in Guyana. Yeah, after two Ow. belongs to you. <laughs> After two belongs to you. I like this. Talk for two minutes and get ten free more value with GTNT. It stands to say into you. Start talking, then after two. Talk, talk, talk. No limit, two for ten. Get with it. GTNT brings more value to you. Talk for two minutes and enjoy ten free. GTNT best value in Guyana. You know, uh, listening to David, uh, though I hadn't Which one? <laughs> <laughs> younger, younger. Younger, younger David. Uh, 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 more progressive. <laughs> no, 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 no. The general secretary. The general secretary, the general secretary. of the <laughs> AFC. Probably young is the operative word. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The, 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 um, I hadn't contemplated that we would have gone into some of the details of some of what fact transpired but what is fundamentally coming through is that this is not a Gokul Budu problem alone exactly. this has to do with the whole structure and operations of of GCOM and so the inevitable question is what it is that is about this system that we can change to stop that kind of thing taken into account they have to limit it the realities of our existing situation all right, let me just, I, I'll have a quick stab from, yeah. from the Alliance for Change on, on that thing. So one, we're speaking about term limits in the sense of, I mean, the, the GCOM Commission, not because of, um, not because of the thing, but we're talking about term limits. I mean, there, um, there are four persons, well, three persons now that were on the 206 panel that, 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 that are in, in GCOM at the moment, including the commissioner and the two PPP um, commissioners. We're speaking about widening the base of of, of, of GCOM in for, for um, other other stakeholders. You know, I mean, the Jamaica model, which we're lauding, has civil society on it. I mean, I think a, I think a seven-man party, um, seven-man commission, only three are representative of the um, of political parties. And as well, the mechanism of selection of our chairperson has to be addressed. You know what I mean? And, and I mean, as the, all four, um, three panels, four panels in the independence of these persons, you know, I mean, um, it's a well-paid job, so therefore you can, you can actually get a well, a professional person uh, taking the job without encumbering his um, livelihood. So um, we just have to sit down and, 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 and politically negotiate a common solution for the good of the country. <laughs> Well, if I could jump in here, a point which I think may, may not otherwise come up. 
um, like a number of other constitutional bodies, GCOM is treated as a subvention agency and is operates under the aegis of a minister, who in this instance is the president, with the HPS being the permanent secretary. So the GCOM does not have the required autonomy, which very often starts with the purse to do its work unfettered. And I think it's important, even if you change those commissioners, if you continue to have a relationship where the office of the president determines when monies are released, you're going to continue to have a problem uh, with GCOM. They need to be given some autonomy um, in, in, in that regard. It's critical. There are some other areas too, I think, that need to be dealt with. Critical in an election is the regional officer. And what the government does is tries its best to ensure that in every region they're in charge of the person. So that even if the region is a region that would normally be won by the opposition, the officer in charge must be somebody that the government is comfortable with. And therefore there's another dimension that has to be dealt with. In the last election, I dealt with Linden. And one of the decisions we took very early was that by the time the elections are over, one hour after, we should have a tally of what are the results in Linden so that they can't tamper with the Elections Commission. Vincent will tell you, I called him at 1 o'clock and said, these are the results of Region 10. I'm saying this to say to you, the political parties have a role to play. If the PPP believes that in every area the opposition will have the exact results, they will then think twice before they, did. they do what they will normally do. And so some of it has to be placed at the feet or the foot of the opposition political parties. <coughs> in the note, the opposition political parties do not do their work in a meticulous, structured, and organized way that permit them at the end of the election to know what the results actually are and therefore stop the PPP from its levels of illegalities. So whatever you do with the commission, you need to rectify the political party problem. There's, not, there's, there's, only, a, there's only a quick thing that I want to say there, Aubrey. I mean, um, I, Vincent, you could, you, you, you could um, correct me here, but I think the appointment of the regional persons are done through the commission. It's all done through the commission, but the extent to which the commission is constituted the way it's constituted, yeah. the politics, there's a politics of appointments as well, yeah. and that is always, you know... You um, mentioned that in your article. Yeah. So you have that, you have that, 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 that problem. Yeah. The, the, the political interest is always brought to bear on who the, the, the appointees are. The same way in which there's an attempt to bring it to bear and who will be the chief election officer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that one has no, I just wanted to bring that back to say it all, you know me, that, 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 there, that, so there's, that, there's, that there's, if, you, if you can fix the commission, you can yeah. probably fix the same issue. But I, I, I agree with yeah. Aubrey, because I have my own experience outside of the commission, that um, uh, political parties being more conscious and more vigilant could make some a greater difference. Mm -hmm. Could make a difference. And I will do a, a new disclosure here tonight. Um, as a part of the process of monitoring the elections and the results, I took to making a personal record of every result that came in. And I, I, was, I virtually sat through the process for 48 hours without sleep and attempted to record every result that came in. So I would have been in the position I'll be just talking about to have a result mm -hmm. second version mm -hmm. clear. Mm -hmm. And I was stopped. Mm -hmm. Internally, I was stopped. I was accused of being the person who was slowing up the process. Mm -hmm. And I was stopped. So I wasn't able to follow that process. Through. You were stopped by an action of the commission? Largely, the first person who intervened and said that I was being disruptive was Mr. Budu. Mm -hmm. Oh, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I was stopped. Bradley, I, I associate myself with, with, with a lot of the, well, all of the um, suggestion for what, it, what we're really talking about, short-term solution. Um, 
And I, 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 I think that one of the things we need to do is to try as much as possible um, to minimize the uh, uh, minimize the opportunities for um, for stealing elections and for people like um, Mr. Boudou to go in action and so forth. Um, and I think the electoral rules themselves need to be changed because the way in which our rules are, I mean, the PPP, for example, I have um, a, a, an investment in ensuring that they win a plurality of the votes or a majority vote. If they don't win a majority, win a plurality, and they get the presidency and run the country and so on and so forth. That some of those rules need to go. I really don't believe that we ought to go back to an election under those rules, where you have a party with a minority basically running the government without any hindrance and so forth. So if we were to reduce this, the high stakes, if you will, by a much fairer political system that ensures a fairer participation after the election, then you take a lot of the incentive that they have for stealing the elections um, out, 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 out of the system. I think that's a short-term uh, way to go. The struggle is not just to reform GCOM, but to reform the electoral system. Uh, and the two and the should go uh, 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 hand in hand. I'm glad you raised that, because that was the point on which I, I think a significant focus has to be placed. Yes, I want to make ahead. another point. Education, and I want to give of my own experience. Governments are smart. They create the impression that the government is in charge of the election. I had some experiences in Linden where on one occasion the prime minister was trying to give instructions to people. So I told them, I said, look, there's no prime minister here today. Here you have Sam Hines, the candidate, and Aubrey Norton, the candidate. This candidate, Aubrey Norton, objects to the Mr. Sam Hines. So the girl was, I said, there's no prime minister, let's take out the rules, and the prime minister left. I had a similar activity with, I think, Ropes and Ben. The point I'm making here, again, we need to educate the people who are working to let them know that on election day, they, these candidates are the people with power. There's no prime minister mm -hmm. over the election. There's no minister. And they use that a lot to intimidate people on election day. And that is why I was very critical of how we train our workers. In the Linden case, I spent a lot of time telling them there is no minister of government. There is no prime minister. And I think that needs to be dealt with if, to understand that the Elections Commission operates independent of the government in this regard. Yes. Um, the thing is that uh, David has just raised the issue, one of the issues that we had considered when we looked at next steps, uh, that was most fundamental to all of this. And that is that we seriously have to rethink. Some time ago, even before the 2006 elections, there were parts of our society that were saying, look, let's not go back to the elections with this story, with this winner-take-all, hybrid, whatever it is that, you, that we got, that ultimately seems to be just an ethnic census in a certain sense. And therefore, that we got to, in a fundamental sense, we have to change that thing once and for all. You only got a half a minute each to make your quick comment on that in closing. If I can make my quick comment, I think that in this attempt to deconcentrate the struggle for power, that what we do with local government is very critical. I really am an advocate of subsidiarity, which suggests that a lot of the authority and a lot of the functions that are central could be decentralized. And in that way, the central state becomes less, and we have much more scope uh, to diffuse the kind of problems we have at, 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 at the central election time. Yes, I tell you what, we are going to have to follow this up uh, because we have an entire program that is dedicated to the local government question. Because the whole question of elections, commission, and elections, the first place and time we are going to test whatever it is we agree on is going to be on these local government elections. And whether, in fact, we should work with the formula that we currently have, where, um, well, uh, we shan't go there. State of preparedness, etc. what it means for the country and its people. The, 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 are representatives truly representative? Or are they still going to be, be minions of some, some big chief, as we currently have at our national situations, etc.? 
all of those issues. Your uh, concluding I agree comments, with sir. Vincent, essentially, and I will add uh, David Heinz's point of the need for a political solution. I believe Ghana needs some amount of power sharing for a while. My only worry now, when I became an advocate of power sharing, the government wasn't as corrupt. <laughs> and I, I worry now, I, 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 I do believe in power sharing, corruption? but I, I would really like to see me share with a group that really has Ghana heart and is not as corrupt as the present lot. Hmm. Yes, quickly, you know, of course, you know, I mean, there's no dissenting voice from me or my party on any of this topic. I mean, local government elections, I think, is absolutely essential. You mean devolution of power from the center? Well, it uh, empower our citizens um, once again. Um, what we would like out of this process, the start of this process, is that we can have elections and we can have um, the whole electoral process where the people of Guyana can buy into, right? And whatever is needed to be done to ensure that that happens, that I would commit myself and my party to. Um, I'm going to end on something that may not be very popular, but I think every time we have made a breakthrough, certainly in the last 20, 30 years on anything fundamental, it was because of external intervention. And I do think, certainly at the level of CARICOM, that we need a much more observation external observation, and I'll confine it to regional for the time being, um, that our elections and our process more than any other process in the Caribbean needs a lot of external um, faces. I think, I, think, I, I think the political forces here tend to respond to external pressures more than um, they would do to the internal civil society pressure. Mm. Uh, those will be the last words <laughs> from our discussions on this question of elections and the Elections Commission. S uh, suffice it to say that one specific issue which we did not uh, have an opportunity to discuss at this stage is in fact the very last issue being raised by um, by David and that is if it is that we don't trust ourselves if it is that we have underdeveloped institutions civil society groupings etc etc and we don't trust ourselves to administer something as fundamental and so profound as the agency that will record our preferences and tell us quite uh, um, uh, correctly that this is what we want, then we should actually consider, and some have posited this with increasing um, loudness, that we should involve external groups in the Elections Commission itself. Um, for whatever sets of reasons, I know that goes to the heart of people like, our, like all of us who are, are children of, of a post of a post-emancipation, um, post-colonial uh, colonial <laughs> period, but that perhaps practical solutions may be required where the emotions will not otherwise allow us to go. I, this issue of the, this is really another issue of next steps, uh, where we have taken on board a specific area uh, the Elections and Elections Commission. Obviously, the next issue in this particular uh, series is the local government election. And I would urge you to, to look forward to meeting with our panel, even as we count on something that is so profoundly important in the whole governance structure of this country that that uh, we will empanel a group of persons who can help us with this particular area. Some of the members of this panel may want to volunteer, but definitely that would be the next issue on next steps as we pursue, hopefully, trying to identify the issues in this country that are perhaps a little bit more important than the firefighting with which we have been obsessed over the last two years or so. I'm Grant Lee Waller and saying good night from Spotlight. Yeah, after two Ow! belongs to you. <laughs> after two belongs to you. I like this. 
talk for two minutes and get 10 free more by you with GTNT. It stands to say into you, start talking, and after two, talk, 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 no limit, two for ten. Get with it! GTNT brings more value to you. Talk for two minutes and enjoy 10 free. GTNT, best value in Guyana.